بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد. So we're going to read a hadith, and this hadith is very important for us because it talks about the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it talks about the right of His creation, meaning you and I, other people. It talks about our right. This hadith contains both the haq of Allah and the haq of His servants, which means you and I, those people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even those people who don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they are created by Allah, that they have rights as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them rights. An Abi Dhar wa Mu'adh bin Jabal radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma an Rasulillahi an Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal ittaqi allaha haytha ma kunt wa attabi' sayyat al-hasana tamhuha wa khaliki al-nasa bi khukin hasana رواه أبو داود وأحمد وترمذي وغيرهم بإسناد حسن. In this hadith, the hadith of Abi Dhar and Mu'adh bin Jabal رضي الله تعالى عنهم رضي الله تعالى رضي الله تعالى عنهما. May Allah subhanahu wa taala be pleased upon uh, with both of them that they were both Sahaba, companions of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم. And both of them narrated this hadith. They said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Fear Allah wherever you are. Ittaqullah haytha ma kunt. Fear Allah wherever you are. And follow up your bad deeds with good deeds. It will erase them. So your bad deeds erase your deeds. Your, I mean, I'm sorry, your good deeds erase your bad deeds. And it can be vice versa too. You don't want to do something good and then do something bad after it. But the hadith, it says, follow up your bad with your good. So if you do something bad, you should then immediately try to remember to do something good, to get that deed erased, the idnillah. And treat people with beautiful manners with righteous manners, good manners. So that is, as I mentioned, and this was uh, narrated in, uh, this was collected in Abu Dawood, by Abu Dawood, uh, Abi Dawood, uh, Imam Ahmed, and Tirmidhi, and other than them. So in this hadith, we learn many, many benefits. Some of the benefits, just in the general meaning of the hadith, is that we see that the hadith refers first, it says, fear Allah. Fear Allah wherever you may be. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you may be. Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to do with the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to do with worship. Taqwa. Taqwa is worship. Taqwa is the type of worship. Anything Allah is pleased with is worship. Anything Allah is displeased with is a sin. So, Sana. If Allah doesn't like something, is that, a, is that worship? Huh? If Allah doesn't like something, is that worship? Is that something we should do? No. Okay, good. If Allah loves something, then that means what? This, this is for uh, Neda. Huh? If Allah loves something, like it's mentioned in the Quran that Allah loves it, in Allah yuhibbu tuabin. In Allah, in Allah yuhibbu mutafahareen. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the pure people, the pure ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the, uh, uh, the, the sabreen, you know, the people who are patient. So if Allah loves that thing, that means what? That means you get edger for doing it. So it's an act of worship. If Allah loves something, or like something, that means by doing it, it's worship. And if the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it as something that he loved it or he commanded us with, then this is an act of worship. So, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
Fear Allah wherever you are. So that means wherever. It means when you're in the masjid, when you're at home, if you go to the mall, if you go to the market, if you go anywhere, you should fear Allah. You should try to remember Allah. And you should stay away from the bad things, the things that Allah hates. That is a part of remembering Allah and fearing Allah. Ittaqillah. Okay? And let's see what some of the scholars in Islam, they said about taqwa. The scholars here we're talking about, we're talking about the Salaf as the righteous predecessors. First and foremost, starting with the Sahaba. What did some of the Sahaba say about this statement, ittaqillah, or a taqwa? Uh, Ali, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, so he was the fourth uh, Khalifa, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, At-taqwa hi al-khawf min al-jaleel wa amal bi tanzeel wa istadad li yawm al-raheel wa rida min al-dunya bin al-qaleel. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that taqwa or fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, fear, is, is, is being uh, fearful of the Almighty, meaning the fearful of Allah. And it is doing or acting upon the revelation, meaning the Quran. So first it's fearing Allah, it's acting upon the Quran, and it is being prepared for the day of judgment, for Yom Al-Qiyamah, the day that, when you, uh, that we'll be raised up for, the, meaning that we will die in this life, and we will be raised up on the day of judgment, and Allah will look at all of our deeds. Huh? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Zilzalah? Women, Femenia, huh? Dharatan, Shariyarah, Mumtaz. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know there that on that day, that the person who does bad deeds, it will be known, it will be seen. They will see their bad deeds. They're going to see your, you're going to see the bad things you did. It's going to be on your scale. And the good things you did will be on the scale as well, be on the other scale. So we want our scale to be heavy with good and light with uh, bad. So, he said that this is the meaning of taqwa and that it is also being pleased uh, being pleased or seeking pleasure and enjoyment in this life just a little bit. Just a little bit. Because, why did Ali radiallahu ta'ala say that? Because when people get very involved in this life, that everything they do, they just love the dunya. It's harder for them to fear Allah because they only want the good things. They only want to watch movies. They only want to do anything they want. They only want to eat sweet things. They just want to do anything that their desires want. Then they'll forget Allah because they won't be thankful. The person who just engages in everything in this life, they're usually not thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They forget. Because they're so busy with the dunya. So, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, and when this is how the, the Salaf as the pious predecessors were, is that they only took a little bit what they needed in this life. They didn't just take everything and, you know, I have to have all the expensive things in this life. I have to do only fun things. I have to enjoy everything. No. They took what was necessary. They didn't take a lot of clothes. They didn't take a lot of uh, uh, animals, riding animals and stuff like this. They took what was necessary to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get their jobs done, to do what they needed to do. So this is the case of the Salaf as So that is one meaning, that's what Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said when he explained taqwa, what it means, fearing Allah. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, another sahabi, he said, Hiya, when he was talking about taqwa, he said, Hiya an yata'a allaha fala ya'ti, wa yadkir fala yansa, wa yashkir fala yakfir. 
uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, when he described taqwa, he said it is to be obedient to Allah and not disobedient to Him. And it is to remember Allah and not forget Him. And it is to be thankful to Allah and not ungrateful for His favor. That's what he said taqwa is. So he said taqwa means that you should be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from those things that are bad that will make you go into disobedience. And that you should remember Allah a lot, often. You know, always, you know, make dhikr. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Like this, you should always have that on your tongue. Remembering Allah. And you should remember Allah before you do something bad. If you're going to do something bad, remember, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. So then stop it. This is what he said is taqwa. The meaning of taqwa. And these meanings are very similar. There's no contradiction. In Islam, the scholars, they have what's called, this is maybe a little above your head, but they say uh, when things are, not, the definitions are not exactly the same uh, between the scholars, they call it ikhtilaf a tanoa. That means the ikhtilaf, the difference is not a big difference. They use some different words, but the meaning is still the same. So the meaning of Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, both their meanings were the same, that they both, when they described taqwa, the meanings were similar. It wasn't ikhtilaf of tabad, which means that the, 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 the meanings or the definitions contradict each other. Okay? The third companion of the Prophet wasallam that also described uh, taqwa, or many of the companions, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, described uh, Define this for us, but here's another Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His name was Abu Darda. Abu Darda, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, when he described taqwa, he said, Hiya an yukun li sanaka rutbin bi dhikrillah ta'ala. He said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that taqwa means that your tongue will be wet from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rashad, why would your tongue be wet from remembering Allah? What's the relationship between remembering Allah and your tongue being wet? What's the relation? Do you understand what that means? Okay, so listen. What that means, when the, they use this term in Arabic, rat, uh, which means to be wet or like this, but when he says, and uh, yukun lisanaka rutbin, for your tongue to be wet means that you're remembering Allah on your tongue. You're making dhikr by your mouth. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar. When you move your tongue a lot, it's getting what? It's producing moisture in your mouth. Moisture is produced in your mouth from your, uh, the different glands in your mouth. And so when you're moving your tongue, remembering Allah, that, that means your tongue is wet from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, uh, those were some of the different definitions that some of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, said regarding taqwa. And that also, uh, another beautiful definition, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam said, Allah yarhamahu, when he described taqwa, he said, Hiya an taj'al baynaka wa bayn al-azab illahi wa qaya bi fi'l al-awamri what Nawahi. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah had a beautiful definition. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said that taqwa, it is to make a, uh, to put something between you and between the punishment of Allah. Something in between you, like a shield, like a guard, between you and the punishment of Allah. And the way you do that is by doing good deeds and leaving the prohibited things, leaving bad deeds. So, sir, how can we put that waqaya or that shield or that guard or that barrier between us and the punishment of Allah? How can we do that? What should we do? What should we do if we want to put uh, a guard between us and the punishment of Allah? Who can help her? Uh, by doing good things. By doing good things. And we do good things and we? Uh, don't do bad things. 
Ascent Muntaz Barakalatikum. No. So we do the good deeds and we stay away from the bad deeds. When we do that, that makes a shield between us. Between us and the sin and uh, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah punishes people when they're doing evil, for doing evil things. And for doing having disbelief in Him. And the things He's ordered us to believe. Then we'll be punished for that. When we do good, we'll be rewarded. So when you do the good deeds, that's like a shield for you from the punishment. And when you do, when you stay away from the bad deeds, that's also a part of that shield. So then, going back to the hadith, we'll wrap it up since they called me Adhan. That also, that was some of the definitions for taqwa. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, What tana sayyat al hasanata tamhuha. He said, and then follow your bad deeds with good deeds. And it will, it will erase them. So that means, for example, if you do something bad, say you uh, get in a fight with someone unjustly, or you take something from someone, that doesn't belong to you. That was a bad deed, right? If you steal, that's bad, right? Okay. Then after that, you think about it, you fear a law, and you say, I'm going to return that back to that person. I took so-and-so's pencil, I took so-and-so's, uh, their book, or whatever, I'm going to return it back to that person. That means then you're doing a good deed, after you did something bad. And then, on top of that, maybe you also decide, I'm going to give one dollar to this poor man. I see a poor man begging, I think I'll give him one dollar. Or I'm going to help this person who needs help. I'm going to help this old lady she needs across the street. I'm going to help her and stop the traffic and help her. That means you're doing good deeds. So if you did something bad, and then after you do something good, it will erase that bad deed. As long as the bad deed wasn't a major, major sin. The major sins you have to make toba, you have to make repentance from. But if it was something minor, anyway, the fact that you do a good after you do something bad, will help erase it, and it will be good on your scales on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said in the uh, last part of the hadith, he said, and show people good manners. Be good to people, show good manners and good uh, conduct to the people. That means you should be the most polite. When the people see you, they should say, oh, that guy Rashad, he's really polite. That girl, Nenej, mashallah, she has very good manners. Oh, that girl, Sarah, she's, uh, mashallah, so polite and so good manners. We, we really like when she's around. That is, you will get edgier from Allah for that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees all of your deeds. So when you do something good and you show good manners, this is going to go on your good scales on the Day of Judgment. And also the Prophet sallallahu said in another hadith, he said, "Ma min shayin akhlu fi meizan a mu'min yom al qiyamah min husn al khuk, wa in the Allah yubqid al fayish al hadith." So the Prophet of Allah the Sallam said in this hadith, and maybe we'll uh, read that hadith and explain it in detail uh, another time. But in this hadith, he said to Allah the Sallam, he said that there isn't a thing on the scale of a believer. Uh, there isn't a, scale, a thing on the scale of a believer that's heavier on the scale of a believer on the day of judgment than good manners. And verily, Allah hates sinful speech. What is sinful speech? Cursing people, saying bad things to people, lying to people with your tongue. Anything bad you say with your tongue? This is sinful speech that Allah hates. So if you lie, if you curse people, if you call somebody uh, a bad name, you say something bad to them, all of this is hateful speech that Allah hates. So that is very important that we have good manners and we try to fear Allah wherever we are. And we try to do good deeds to put between us and our sins, and the punishment of Allah. And that when we do something bad, we try to follow it up with something good. Some of the quick, some of the ways that we can make, uh, we can have the forgiveness of Allah, one of the things is just by having Iman Billah, by believing in Allah. 
Reading the Quran, that strengthens your man. And knowing the meaning, not just memorizing it and not knowing the meaning, we have to learn the tafsir. We have to learn the explanation so that way we can know what it means. And that will help your heart. Also, you should make a stuff far a lot to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, you should do good deeds. Also, you should make toba, repentance. Also, we should, uh, uh, some other things that m- make our sins go away is if we are sick. We don't want to get sick, but when you're sick, Allah will, will, will remove some of your sins. Also, uh, when someone is uh, having a difficult death, when they're on their deathbed and they're dying and they're experiencing pain, if they're a believer, that will remove some of their sins for them. Uh, and there's other ways as well. Those are just some of the ways in which our sins can be forgiven. So what we learn from this hadith is that it's an obligation. We should fear Allah. We should always remember Allah is watching us. We should also um, try to do good deeds to put between us and our bad deeds and between the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should also try to make toba to Allah a lot and make istighfar a lot. We should also try to have good manners. We should also uh, be careful not to love the dunya too much. This life, not to love it too much, not to want everything. We don't have to have every PlayStation game. We don't have to have everyone have their own P2 station and their own uh, uh, this and that and the other. We don't have to love everything. It's okay you have some things and you enjoy some things, but you don't have to have everything. If you see Tommy or you see Muhammad or you see Khalid, he has the nicest phone. It doesn't mean you have to have the nicest phone. Or when you get older, so-and-so has a beautiful car, you have to have the nicest and most expensive car. No, because that's not going to benefit you. Think about those things that benefit you, bring you closer to Allah. Sometimes those things in this life will make you further from Allah. You get a lot of money, some people, they forget Allah. They say, oh, I don't need Allah. I've got all this money. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to travel here. I'm going to take vacation. And they don't remember Allah, and they only do haram with their money. And some people are blessed with that ni'mah from Allah, the blessings from Allah, and they do good with it. And we ask Allah the Almighty to bless us to be of those who do good with whatever blessings He gives us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.